Hello and welcome. My name is Zoltan Koshkovich. I am a geopolitical analyst for the Center for Fundamental Rights. And to use a fashionable term these days, it is my privilege to welcome uh, Professor David Azarad, who is an assistant professor and research fellow at Hillsdale's College, Washington, DC. Prior to joining Hillsdale, uh, Professor Azarad was the director at the Beacon and Simon Center for Principles and Politics at the Heritage Foundations. Foundation. Welcome, David. It's a great honor to have you. Thank you for having me, Zoltan. I'm very happy to be here with you. David, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to speak about the general uh, state of affairs in American conservatism. You are one of the most passionate critics of American conservatism on the right. Can you tell us where the movement went wrong? Was it led astray by its leaders or was apathy among the rank and file at fault? It's a very good question. Um, I should first of all say, I don't know, well, maybe I'm one of the most passionate ones, but I, you know, I see myself as uh, standing on the shoulder of giants. I mean, the two in particular, I think, who've really done the best work on this is Paul Gottfried, who is now the editor of Chronicles Magazine, a longtime uh, historian, um, really fine scholar. And then Sam Francis, who passed away maybe 20 years ago, uh, both, you know, paleo conservatives who were very critical of the mainstream American conservative movement. Um, and I, I think anyone who's interested in, in the deepest analysis should turn to their work. In terms of why the movement went wrong, um, I think it's, it begins with, uh, from the outset, so if, if we speak of mainstream American conservatism, I think people generally mean post-World War II. So Bill Buckley, National Review, fusionism, Kirk, Hayek, and so on and so forth. There was an earlier conservative movement uh, at the turn of the 20th century uh, that tried to fend off early progressivism. But generally, when we speak of conservatism, that's what we mean. I think it went wrong for two reasons. The first one is, I think it adopted an incorrect definition of conservatism. So I don't know if your audience will be familiar with the term fusionism. But fusionism was the idea that American conservatism should bring together traditionalism and libertarianism uh, in order to fight communism, that there should be an alliance between the traditionalists. You could think of the more Burkean strain of American conservatism, localism, decentralization, a slower pace of life, suspicious of the excesses of markets, of corporate power, of rapid changes in life. And on the other hand, they brought in the you know, libertarian classical liberal economists who were all about economic freedom, limiting the power of the state and uh, well, as much, you know, wor borderline worship of markets. And the problem is that the, these two elements were not mixed in equal proportions. So what ended up happening is that the moral center of gravity, the software, if you want, on which conservatism ran ended up being a version of libertarianism that basically thought that the government was the root of all evil and that the point of life was to maximize individual liberty and that the private sector could borderline do no harm. Uh, it was rarely put this way, but this is what, I mean, you see it very much in Reagan's rhetoric. So if you set aside his actions, you know, he, he uh, governed better than he spoke, I, I find. But his rhetoric was very libertarian. You know, uh, you look at Barry Goldwater, who, you know, famously tried to become president in 64 and wrote a book called The Conscience of a Conservative. It might as well have been called The Conscience of a Libertarian. And this sets them up. The, the deeper problem is that the conservatives, I thought, did not know how to use power because they hated the government so much. Uh, they thought the point of life was just to get rid of the government. And when they were in power, A, they had almost no success with that. I mean, they succeeded in lowering taxes, but even Reagan never abolished a single department or agency. I mean, if you look at a graph of the size and growth of government since World War II, I mean, it's like this. And, you know, Reagan slowed down the rate of growth, but there are no dips when Reagan is in power, when Bush is in power. So they were so virulently anti-government that one, they effectively didn't know how to use power, which is, means that conservatism proved to not be a governing philosophy. 
it proved to be an intellectual pose. Uh, and second, they were really quite either blind to the very nefarious developments in the popular culture, culture that undermined Republican self-government and the American way of life, or to the extent that they were aware of them, really were not capable of opposing them. And so I, I think there is a sense in which, from the beginning, conservatism was ill-defined uh, and ill-deployed. And as a result, you know, there have been some victories here and there. But on the whole, you know, if you look at the last 70 years, you know, more or less, so Bill Buckley uh, launches National Review in 1955, so almost 70 years. You know, the trajectory of, American, of America has been, I mean, quite bad in all realms. I mean, the Republicans have won electoral victories. They have appointed, the Republicans have appointed justices to the Supreme Court. But that is a means to an end. If you look at actual policy outcomes, if you look at the fertility rate, if you look at the degree of degeneracy, depravity, and vulgarity in the public square, if you look at the size, scope, and reach of government, if you look at middle-class incomes, if you look at, you know, I mean, a host of metrics, the country is worse off today than it was when conservatism began. And so the problem is that conservatism refuses to admit that it has failed. Mm -hmm. It has concocted a rich mythology of these great conservative victories but they tend to mostly be, you know, electoral, or I should add the end of the Cold War, the demise of communism, but that's a foreign policy victory in terms of at home. And which means it's a problem because if you don't realize that you've been losing decade after decade, then you can't correct your course. And so, you know, my friendly advice to mainstream conservatism as someone who is on the right would be, you know, you need to have a you know, what Khrushchev did with Stalin, like, let's sit down and admit that, you know, it's a bit of an overwrought uh, comparison. <laughs> Obviously, what conservatism did to America is not what Stalin did to Russia, but we need to admit that this has not been working. Uh, we need to be honest with ourselves and try something new. But the, the, I don't see conservatism doing that anytime soon because uh, it's, a, it's a very lucrative business model that the magazines the think tanks, the nonprofits run, they fundraise a lot of money, especially from the older baby boomer generation by peddling Reagan nostalgia, by peddling, you know, anti-communism. Uh, and so they raise a lot of money and have a lot of comfortable sinecures. Uh, and so I, I, I don't regrettably see anything changing anytime soon in the mainstream conservative right. The good news, though, is that there is a new right that is bubbling in America that is younger, more aggressive, not beholden to the pieties of the past. Uh, and, and I think uh, very much aware of how bad of a shape the country is in and the need to do something different and that it's not you know, <clears throat> more tax cuts that are going to save America. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because it sounds a little bit as if you were saying that capitalism is preventing uh, the old conservative movement from facing up to its mistakes in the past. Is that, well, did I get that right? Yes and no. So look, I, I don't like the term capitalism particularly. I find it has market Marxist uh, connotations. Uh, and also, let's be honest, everyone on the right opposes central planning and the nationalization of industry. So uh, everyone believes uh, that there's no alternative but free markets and that markets are good for generating prosperity, for giving people opportunities, and that they're fair because they protect property rights and allow for competition and trade. The problem is not markets. The problem is free market fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. The problem mm -hmm. is putting economists in charge of political decisions. The problem is refusing to subordinate markets to considerations of the common political good. So, you know, the, the way I put it to my students is borders make no sense from an economic point of view. They are an arbitrary impediment to the free flow of goods, peoples, and services. That said, borders are the essence 
of politics. I mean, that, that's what politics is about, is you guys are not Polish, you're Hungarians, because yeah. there are borders. I'm Canadian, not American, because there are borders. And so that's not to say that you need to have zero immigration or zero trade. No one says that, although, honestly, uh, I'd be fine with zero immigration <laughs> for a long time now to digest the immigration we've had. But that the economists who, who prize market efficiency above all else should not be making political decisions. So I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a rhetorically uh, fruitful way to talk about this, to say I'm opposed to capitalism or opposed to markets. I also think it's incorrect. I mean, I, I believe in markets and I, I can't speak for you, but I suspect that the Hungarian right is not in favor of central planning and having you know, five-year plans on how many shoes you need to produce. No, you believe in markets, but you are not free market fundamentalists. That's the problem, the libertarians, really who have been elevated by the conservatives to positions of authority that they should not hold. So ultimately, you know, libertarians, it's a free country. You can believe what you can believe. The problem for the American right is that the conservative movement is filled with libertarians. So you know, to, to give you an example, you could go from AEI or the Heritage Foundation or the, Hutz, uh, the Hoover Institution, three of the biggest conservative think tanks. As an economist, you could go work at Cato the biggest libertarian think tank, and not have to change any of your views. You couldn't do that, for example, if you did foreign policy at Heritage, at AEI, or at Hoover. You, you couldn't go work at Cato. They would never hire you. But on the right, there's kind of an interchangeability. Like the, the Buckley decided, the right decided, we're going to farm out to libertarians all economic thinking. We are not going to do political economy anymore. We're going to let them speak for us. And that's the mistake. I see. <clears throat> I see. You identify conservatism as traditionally counter-revolutionary in nature, a political creed that resists revolutionary change, that works to preserve all that's good in society from social engineering and manipulation. And yet you have claimed that today's conservatives must themselves become revolutionary in their ambition to counter the left's growing hegemony. How do you resolve this seeming contradiction? Um, I resolve it by pointing out the fact that <clears throat> what would Burke have said had he written 200 years after a successful French Revolution? Remember, Burke opposed the father of you know, modern Western conservatism, uh, wrote shortly after the French Revolution and opposed it, and so was a conservative and not a reactionary. But what do you do if you don't feel at home in your own country anymore. You know, the, the normal politics would have the left feel alienated from a country because they find it repressive, not sufficiently progressive. And the right feels at home in their own country. And what we've had as a result of, you know, basically a century in America of progressivism, liberalism, uh, democratic socialism, feminism, the sexual revolution, black power, identity politics, you name it, is a right that really does not feel at home in its own country, th that feels that the regime despises it, is hostile to the traditional American way of life, to the principles of the founding, to the things that conservative Americans love. And then here's where it gets really dangerous, is that even though the left runs the country in terms of its ideas, it too feels alienated from the country because it claims it is systemically racist. It claims that it's a patriarchy. You know, you listen to them, they make it sound like white men are, you know, roaming wild with guns, shooting black people on demand and raping women at will. And so part of what makes our political moment dangerous is that both sides feel alienated from the country and are, are animated with revolutionary longings. But to return to the conservative question, you know, it seems to me that this wouldn't apply to a Hungarian context, because as you know, uh, your prime minister, uh, Viktor Orban, so nicely said is, you know, the cold, communism kind of froze you in the past. And when it ended, you got to look into the future at the West and say, oh, no, we don't want to go down that route. So you have been spared from some of the terrible things that have afflicted us, like namely enormous amounts of third world immigration. But 
generally speaking, in America and in the West, I mean, you see it with Eric Zemmour's recent campaign announcement. I don't know if, if uh, you saw it. I mean, it's really extraordinary. But the underlying sentiment is French people don't feel at home in France anymore. This is not our country. And so it means that conservatism today actually isn't all that conservative. It's more reactionary. Now, the problem in saying that is that people will say, ah, you see, you're a radical I mean, reactionary is a four letter word that has bad <laughs> connotations. So I, I'm, by saying this, I'm not suggesting that Julius Evola speaks for conservatives. I just mean that this kind of more timid, gentlemanly temperament that you find in many conservatives, I don't think is suited for the moment. So I think the, the beginning of wisdom, the red pill, you know, to use the language of uh -huh. the kids for the right in the West today is to understand that the regime, i.e. the media, the universities, the mainline churches, the government, the schools, the corporations are overwhelmingly hostile to the ways of life and the mores of the people that the elite is more attached to you know, the, the idea of a universal and homogenous state, as Kojev called it, to be integrated into the global economy, uh, gives privileges to women, people of color, you know, the various oppressed identity groups, and that they are contemptuous, hostile of the normal middle and working class people. And that means that these people and their leaders must have a counter-revolutionary, you know, dare I say, reactionary approach, which should uh, focus on seizing power legally. I'm not calling for violent revolution. But then once you're in power, using that power effectively to reward friends and punish enemies within the rule of law. So I'm not calling for you know, the breaking of the law, but I'm calling for adopting a little bit the mindset of the left, that once you're in power, you should try to channel resources and honor towards the institutions of your base, and you should use the power of the state to defund and the power of the bully pulpit to humiliate the powerful institutions of you know, the globalist identitarian left. Mm -hmm. I see. <clears throat> do, you, do you maybe think that uh, since the death of George Floyd, the United States is in a state of revolution? Do you get this feeling or is this taking it too much? So there's a, an admirable uh, American political theorist who, who passed away two, three months ago. It's a great loss. His name is Angelo Cotavilla. Um, I would recommend that your listeners looking him up. I mean, really a gem of a person and, and a luminous mind. He wrote already, oh my God, four, five, six years ago that America is in a cold civil war. Um, and honestly, after the BLM riots, it got pretty hot. I mean, you know, there were 200 or so American cities were partially burned down, massive riots, encouraged by the elites and the media who called them mostly peaceful. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I think America is in a you know, right now, the, the insanity of the summer of Floyd has receded in terms of violence and rioting. But uh, yes, I think America is in a cold civil war with increasing flashes of hot. And um, I, I just, for one, have a very hard time imagining how the country can be glued back together and have a modicum of coherence. Now, you know, America is not, has never been particularly united. It's called the United States of America. The first constitution was the Articles of Confederation. Up until the Civil War, the United States took a plural. They would say the United States are, not is. The U.S. had a civil mm -hmm. war. Uh, the U.S. has a long federalism, tradition of federalism that really allows for a fair amount of regional uh, variation in, in governance. So. I don't think the model for the US should be a unified homogenous whole where people in LA, Des Moines, Pensacola, uh, and Skokie, Illinois all agree on everything and have the same thing. But I, I, even making an allowance for that, I have a hard time seeing uh, how the country could be, how we could de escalate the civil war. I mean, short of 
honestly escalating it to uh, defund, humiliate, and put out of business the forces that are feeding the poison into the system. So it's paradoxical because a moderate would say, oh, you're calling for an escalation. You're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. But you know, when uh, someone wants to fight you, uh, you better punch back. Yeah, it's very clear that woke capitalism, uh, the corrupt media and the domineering IT uh, giants are part of the problem, uh, yeah. aren't they? And you have to do something with them. And I guess I would like to, you to expand more on what we could or you could do uh, against these forces in American politics, especially in a society that is led by a weak president or a political system that is led by a weak president and, and a political system that is quite frankly dysfunctional. Yeah, and a political system that has generally speaking a weak opposition. You know, the average Republican in, in Congress uh, doesn't really know what time it is, you know, to use another expression that the kids these days uh, like to use that I quite like that my friend Dave Raboy came up with, like uh, who's actually Hungar Hungarian American. Uh, he, say, he says like they don't know what time it is. So I mean, really, the first step is to go back to what we were saying is to just what the the way you put your question. Many establishment conservatives and Republicans still don't see that, for example, big tech is a problem. All they say, well, you know, that, that's the private sector. I mean, what are you saying? You want the government to do something? And then, you know, they're on high alert and they get very uncomfortable. So, you know, if you're going to fight a war, you should first recognize who the enemy is. So that would be first step. Understand that the, all of the elite institutions, and honestly, regrettably, including the top brass of the U.S. military, is peddling wokeness, is in bed with the regime, uh, so that would be one. It's not just you know the bureaucracy or the courts that are bad. It's the elites. Uh, second, then, would be to think of what are their sources of power. And look, it's a combination of money, prestige, uh, and the fact that the laws back them up. You know, for example, in the U.S., we have an enormously complex anti-discrimination civil rights regime. Uh, that is leveraged in the private sector to advance the aims of the, of the woke left. And one would then need a strategy that is focused on defunding, humiliating, uh, and uh, changing the laws that give power to these institutions. So, you know, take, for example, the universities. You know, the universities are the R&D de department for the left. This is where the crazy ideas are incubated and then they're spread into the system and fast forward 30 years later, they become mainstream. So insane ideas like intersectionality, which no one had, you know, outside of 15 academics had heard of is now everyday language in the US. Now, conservatives for a long time have said, oh, the universities are a problem. So they met the first requirement. They understood there was a problem. But in terms of what do you do? Well, their solution was, you know, lament it, uh, fund a speaker series to bring a bunch of people like me on a college campus to give a talk, um, uh, and not much. You know, the universities keep on getting worse. What about defunding them? What about using the fact that Republicans control many state legislatures and that the U.S., as uh, your audience may know, has many of the colleges or state colleges that are funded by the state legislature to start defunding programs like women's studies, you know, African-American studies, uh, anything with critical race theory in it. And um, they didn't do that. And they should also, you know, everyone was hell bent on this idea that everyone has to go to college, that a college is the only credential that allows you to enter to be a respectable person. And we need more of the, you know, laugh in their faces, mm -hmm. mock these credentials. These university diplomas are worthless. So what if you went to Harvard? You probably got in on affirmative action or because your parents went there. And Harvard does not care about the education you receive. You probably don't know a foreign language. You probably have not read Homer. 
Why should I be impressed by your Harvard diploma? But the right has been too deferential towards, for example, higher education. So I want a much more manly, aggressive, confrontational approach that laughs in their faces. I mean, if there's one thing about the woke left is that they are humorous. Mm -hmm. They are too beholden to their pies. Look, like all religious fanatics, religious fanatics are not known for their sense of humor. You know, yeah. Khomeini never laughed. Our woke fanatics don't laugh in their faces, be irreverent, and then once you have power, go after them. Basically, do onto them what they did onto us. Think of politics that way. And, and there I have some hope for the possibility of um, giving the redder states room to breathe. I think if there's some hope in, for a country like the US, it's going to be in, in state defiance uh, to create breathing room for people to lead normal lives. You know, and when I say normal lives, I just mean you know, get married, have kids, uh, go to church, uh, have a job, uh, and, and not have the regime actively be trying to turn your children against you. Right. So let there be confrontation, and the plan is that we win and they lose. Like that's breaking. exactly yeah, that's exactly it. Yes. Don't shy away from fights, but come ready for the fight, and don't be discouraged by the fact that the other side so overwhelms you in terms of power and guns and might. So one danger on the right is, you know, the black pill of despair. It's all over. There's no hope. I, I think that that is uncalled for and premature, that there are, for all of their power, they are utterly incompetent. I mean, look at the Afghanistan debacle. Look at the COVID nonsense. I mean, look at the current occupant of the White House and the woman who's due to succeed him you know, when he loses the last of his faculties, you know, uh, they're not sending us their best. Uh, so yeah, they have the military behind them and the courts and so on and so forth. But this is not a well-oiled machine uh, that is really smart. And, and they're also uh, overplaying their hand and moving too rapidly and too aggressively against the American people and provoking an enormous amount, I think, of hatred from the people against the elites. I don't know if you followed the uh, Let's Go Brandon phenomenon. Have yeah. you heard of this? Of course. Uh, you know, so some people say, I really don't like it. It's unbecoming. It's not okay to basically say F you to the president. But, you know, on the other hand, if you look at the charlatans that run America, <clears throat> I think it's a healthy American manly spirit of defiance, of refusal to bend the knee before these charlatans. So the, the dissatisfaction, the anger is there in the American people. You just need the kind of politicians who can seize it, harness it, and then leverage it against the elites. Right. And, <clears throat> and let me join you in the saying, let's go, Brandon. You know, <laughs> wasn't that a great boon for that uh, race driver uh, whose name was yes. Brandon originally? Right. Okay, so someone who does not shy away from confrontations is Donald Trump. How do you see his role both during his presidency and now when he has effectively become the leader of the opposition? Yeah, so, look, that's a perfect segue for what we talked about. So Trump, I think, had, on the whole, fantastic rhetoric. On the whole, he got, you know, the issues, immigration, uh, trade, the hollowing out of the industrial manufacturing base, reining in the excesses of neoconservative foreign policy. He was utterly irreverent vis-a-vis -vis the elites. I mean, laughing in their faces, dismissive of them. Um, so, so I think on the whole, I mean, I supported him early on, uh, beginning in 2015. I'm glad he won, and I wish he would still be president. That being said, uh, and I say this with you know, an awareness that I'm an armchair intellectual at a university, and that it's very easy to criticize from the comfort of my desk. But uh, I don't think Trump governed effectively. So you, know, you need the rhetoric, but at the end of the day, you can't just humiliate them and attack them and discredit them. You gotta use, be, know how to govern. You gotta first of all have a team of people who align with you who are ready to come in, 
And this was a problem with Trump because look, he did a he did a semi-hostile takeover of the Republican Party. I say semi-hostile because the base loved him, but the Republican establishment hated him. You know, he didn't have, you know, like the way Bush did, a cabinet in waiting stashed at the major think tanks ready to roll in who aligned with him ideologically. You know, he was out of step with the conservative intellectual elites, with the Republican establishment, with his ideas on immigration, on trade, on foreign policy. So, you know, the, the president gets to appoint about 3,000 people in the federal government, uh, by the way, to oversee a bureaucracy of 3 million people. I mean, uh, that's who are career civil servants who are basically unfireable. He only gets 3,000 political appointments. One problem he had was the bench was not deep enough. That being said, he made some bad appointments. And the impression I have formed from the Trump administration is that they were not governing very effectively, understanding how power works. Uh, and so one mistake I think would be to, to draw on the right is, look, we tried everything and it's all over because even Trump didn't fundamentally change things. To which I say, no, I, I don't think we tried everything because what I would like to see is someone in the Trumpist vein who campaigns like a Trump has the rhetorical defiance and aggression of a Trump, but that backs it up with a well-oiled governing machine that goes, starts to purge people in the bureaucracy and remove the legal privileges that prop up the universities, the media, the bureaucracy, and all the centers of power of the left. Right. He, he, he remains, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think he, he did a lot of good for the right in America, uh, and he still has a role to play in the future. Uh, I, for one, would hope he doesn't run again in 2024. Uh, if he runs, I, I, I have a very hard, hard time seeing how any Republican could defeat him. Uh, but, you know, having seen the, the way that the first Trump administration ran, uh, I'd rather see someone who learns lessons from him, follows in his wake, but can govern more effectively. Now the most difficult question, do you have someone in mind? Not really. I mean, look, everyone <clears throat> loves Ron DeSantis, the governor of, of Florida. Um, there is much to admire about him. I, I don't, um, you know, it's in 20, we're in 2021. I, I, I'm, yeah, you know, some sure. people in DC are already thinking about like how to win in 2024. Uh, let's let's wait and see. A, a lot can happen. And look, everything is in turmoil on the right post-Trump. You know, post-2016, we're in the process of a huge reshuffling where a lot of people who were conservatives and Republicans are moving into the Democratic Party, no longer call themselves conservatives. There's a whole bunch of people who are still call themselves conservatives, but are readjusting their ideology. There's a lot of entrepreneurial activity at the think tank level, the magazine level, new voices, a lot of young candidates, primarying establishment candidates. So let's wait and see. Th things are in flux right now, right? Which is um, an exciting moment to follow things because there's a lot of, of movement. And by the way, this to me is another reason not to give up on the country because I am hopeful that out of this process will emerge a much better right that I don't know if they're going to win or if we're going to win. I'm part of it. But, you know, I, I can't say that we're guaranteed to lose the way I am convinced that the current right is a guaranteed way to lose. So let's see what the next few years will be very interesting. Right. They will. They will. <clears throat> OK, so Hungary finds itself now. A uh, rather rare situation it does happen to us once a century, roughly, but we are at the center of the world's attention these days or these years. So uh, can you tell me when it was the first time that you noticed that there was something going on in Hungary that was worth your time inspecting further? And uh, what do you think about uh, Hungary's role in the more general confrontational worldviews? Well, I, I don't want to disagree with my gracious host, but maybe you, I, I don't know if you guys are the center of the world's attention. You know, that might be the US or China, China or the Iranians, but uh, you, you, for a little country in Eastern Europe, 
uh, you do get an enormous amount of attention, both, of course, as you know, tremendous hostility from the elites who say that Viktor Orban is a fascist, but then a lot of admiration from the new right bubbling up, the populist and nationalist right everywhere in the West that sees um, Prime Minister Orban as someone who knows what time it is and is implementing and governing effectively with you know, policies that matter. So... Uh, I, um, I mean, my, my godfather was Hungarian. My parents, I exist because uh, my parents were introduced to one another by a Hungarian in Montreal. So I've known of, of, You're Hungary, welcome. For, I've known of Hungary for a long time. But I, I guess politically, it was probably around the, the time of the, uh, you know, second Obama administration when things started getting really bad in the US. The, when the great awakening mm -hmm. really, uh, started going. Uh, and I think this is, w when did you guys amend your constitution? That was 20... Uh, 20 uh, well, the process started in 2010 and it was finished by 2011. Okay, so I guess that was the first time because I, I remember there was a lot of hysteria and I started looking into it and, and I, I, I thought that it was not warranted. Uh, and then as things got worse and worse here, um, you know, Hungary kept on popping up on the radar and, uh, you know, occasionally speeches by Prime Minister Orban would find their way into the mainstream. And, uh, you know, you'd read them and like, oh, huh, this is pretty good. And so um, I don't follow Hungarian politics enough to offer a comprehensive assessment of what is going on. But on the whole, uh, I, I, you know, what we have a running joke with, our, you know, many of my friends is we're going to need to move to Hungary soon. I mean, th this has become <laughs> yes. a running joke that if things get worse here, we're going to need to move to make sure Hungary. you immigrate legally, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hungary somewhat frowns on illegal immigration. It's, it's something people have noticed about it. Okay, great. Uh, you've heard about CPEC coming to Budapest, haven't you? I, I, I've more than heard of it. I've been invited to, to come mm -hmm. and I'm immensely looking forward to it. And we are immensely really looking forward to having you uh, here at CPEC Hungary. But tell me, what do you think about CPEC more generally as, a, as an American phenomenon? And uh, what do you think about uh, its potential for uh, uniting the world's conservatives into a movement that can resist the global left? I mean, CPAC is fantastic because it, it, it has a tremendous energy and it brings, you know, it's, it's always been, it seems to be much more grassroots. It taps into the conservative base that is not as refined intellectually, but just has much better instincts than the polished people who go to cocktail parties in Georgetown and DC and are professional conservatives. So uh, one thing I've always liked about CPAC is that it's usually held in DC. I mean, this year it's going to be in Orlando for us. But it is not of DC. It brings people from uh, the rest of the country. I don't know that we can unify all of the rights. What I would hope is that the American right would uh, look. There's a certain arrogance in Americans that is understandable. You know, it's America just dominated the 20th century, and there's a tendency amongst Americans to think we're the best at everything. And we don't have anything to learn from anyone. And uh, I, I, like I said, I kind of like that. It, just, it bespeaks a certain confidence that is befitting a great nation. That being said, I think it's, it, it can be taken too far. And I would be more interested in seeing what the American right can learn from the French right, the Hungarian right, look, the European right more generally. I don't think you're going to have a, a fusion or you can just transfer the playbook because America is a different kind of country than the European nations for I mean, reasons that are, we're the new world, you're the old world. I mean, that, that's the, the quick and dirty. Um, but I would be very interested in having more dialogue. So on the one hand, seeing what we could learn from you at the level of policies and strategies, and then I would also say what you can learn from us at the level of policies and strategies, but also at the level of 
failures and warnings. I mean, I return to this point that Prime Minister Orban made that, you know, when the Cold War ended, we looked at the West and we saw that we were looking into the future, that we were 30 years behind. And so, for example, you know, the West got obliterated on gay marriage. Yeah. I mean, that, the speed at which that issue moved through. I have no doubt that Hungary is under pressures uh, to adopt it. I think it would be very fruitful for the Hungarians to study the French and the American cases and to see why did they lose. You know, there were different approaches. The French was more of a grassroots approach, uh, opposition. The Americans, you know, passed into law the Defense of Marriage Act in 96. Oh. I, I think it's important to do case studies of failures to see, because the instincts were good. Like to their credit, the American right opposed gay marriage, but then they lost completely. Why? I think that would be a fruitful exercise for countries that don't yet have some of these developments. Um, so I, 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 to me, it's less about unity than it is about dialogue and ties because we confront similar issues, to some extent, similar enemies. Uh, you know, you are, one of your great exports is Soros, who was- uh, No, 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 no. <laughs> Go on, go on, sorry. It's just a natural Hungarian reaction to the name. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, you can take him back if you want. Uh, no, thank you. So, so <laughs> you know, we, we have similar political enemies we confront, and it would be fruitful to have uh, dialogue. So um, I, I, I'm, um, I, that's another thing that's you know, intellectually exciting and that opens up possibilities is uh, what could emerge from these conversations. Yeah, right. All right, uh, I see that our time is slowly running out, but is there uh, something that I should have asked but haven't asked? And would you like to say something? Uh, did I miss anything? Um, well, I, I no, I, I don't, uh, no, I mean, this, you, you asked some, some good questions and we, I, I guess the one thing I would say um, to the extent that you have a, a Hungarian audience that uh, knows English is uh, to realize that the image they have of America that they get through the media and Hollywood is a distortion, that there is an other America that is never depicted in the New York Times, or if it is, it is with sneering contempt. That you know, you could not tell from watching American television that people go to church in America on Sundays. Not everyone does, but many people do. And there's a, a tendency I found with all foreigners, not just Europeans, to think that they know America inside out because America looms so large, you know, in the collective global imagination because of the NBA, because of Hollywood, because of Harvard. But you know, that's the elite America. Uh, and there is another America out there that is either ignored or distorted in the popular representations. And that I would, um, yeah, not be too quick to dismiss the whole of America based on the garbage that Hollywood is producing. Right, right. I think that we should all take that to heart. And reality is quite different from the pictures and images projected at us. Thank you very much, Professor David Azarad, and thank you to everyone who, who took the time to watch uh, this podcast. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, Zoltan. And I look forward to meeting you in person uh, in, in, uh, at CPAC, in, in person in Budapest. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to that as well. It will be great. Thank you.